everyone. It's the Loudwire Podcast once again, and my name is Graham. My name's Joe. Today, we've got a twofer. The second Loudwire twofer. We've got, first up, Jamie Josta from Hatebreed, from Josta, from the Josta Show podcast, and he's a fellow wrestling mark like myself and big UFC fan. Uh, we talked a little bit about CM Punk and his uh, delving into the UFC. We also talked uh, the next UFC event, UFC 210, uh, Rumble versus Cormier for the belt. Uh, Jamie will talk about that a little bit. And of course, we talked about the tour with Anthrax and Kill Switch Engage, which is happening right now. Definitely catch that. That's a sick bill. And you're going to get some information about the new Josta album. It turns out this stuff's been sitting around for a long time. Yeah. And then there was a little medical issue Jamie had to deal with, and then he used that time laid up to get a whole lot of work done. Yeah, some interesting stuff that he's talking about. So, because this is a twofer, after Josta, you'll hear John Joseph from the Almighty Crow Mags. But first, here's Jamie Josta. So sit down. And shout! All right, everyone, Loudwire Podcast, and we are here with Mr. Jamie Josta. What's up, man? What's going on, guys? Yeah, it's so great to have you here, of course, of Hatebreed and Josta. Uh, Just about to start up the tour, an awesome bill with Anthrax and Kill Switch Engage. And, of course, if you don't get to see Josta, you get to see Code Orange, which is a sick bill as well. Yeah, it's going to be great. I was looking at, like, the pre-sales. These are big places, too. Like, Anthrax and Kill Switch are going to, like— uh, LC Pavilion in Columbus, and they got a lot of mm. tickets sold. It's going to be fun. And for me, I was like, when I got offered the tour, I was like, well, I don't really have anything new. But then I thought, you know what? This is a good reason to rush out my material because I got to yeah. stop with. Yeah, you put out that song with Howard Jones. Yeah, I got to stop with keeping the songs on the hard drive. I need to just get <laughs> over it and just release the shit because people want to hear it, but I'm too critical of it. And I like to work on stuff too long. Mm-hmm. And so. This was a good way for me to choose the songs that I liked and get something out and then have a little short tour on it. Because that's the the goal with Jost is usually just to do really small places mm-hmm. and just to do something completely different. And so this record, I was like, well, it doesn't need to be completely different. It can still be pretty heavy and kind of have the balance with the mel- melody. And because Kill Switch and Devil Wears Prada really do that. And Anthrax is really melodic, too. You know, sure. a lot of songs. So I thought, all right, this is cool. You know, it's. People are like, you're crazy. Why are you going to go and, you know, play 25 minutes and be the first of four? I'm like, mm. because you. I think in music, you're not, you should never be above anything. Like, I have no problem repaying my dues. And, you know, those are venues that I would headline normally with Hatebreed. And mm-hmm. so it's actually kind of refreshing not having all the pressure be on Hatebreed. Like, I can mm-hmm. just... I can go out and do this and we can fucking suck if we want. And it does, you know, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Like, but the point is obviously to, you know, have this different creative output. And so I forced myself to finish these songs and I was laid up. I was, I had two like little minor surgeries. And so I was, oh, really? I, I was out for like eight weeks and uh, I had this like thing on my head. It turned out to be totally benign. It was just a cyst, oh, my God. but they were saying like, don't because I had it removed years ago and it came back, which was worrisome. Dude. And they were saying, you know, don't uh, do any physical activity, especially don't be screaming, you know, your head off in the studio. So mm. I had to choose the songs that had the most vocals done. And then once this uh, little surgery was all healed up, I just touched up the lines that I didn't like and was boom, sent it to the pressing plant. So I got nine songs on this album. It's called The Lost Chapters. I did it totally DIY. It's only yeah. available through my site, uh, martyrstore.net, M-A-R-T-Y-R-S-T-O-R-E. I will be streaming it, but you know, I want everybody to know like nobody benefits <laughs> from the streaming. <laughs> I appreciate that you guys are paying the nine or 10 bucks a month for the streaming things, and I get it, but yeah, if you want to really help us. Um, yeah, it's fractions of a cent. Yeah, if, if, you can, if you can get the physical copy or, or come to one of the shows and, and pick up the CD, that's, that's a big help. So this cyst was kind of like a godsend in a way. It was weird because 
I didn't really want that much time off, but then I thought, well, while I have the time off, let me do the other thing. So then I got like, I went in and I got some dental work done. I was having a tooth that was bothering me. And so I, it ended up making me go like handle a bunch of real life shit that nobody really handles when you're on the road so many days. Yeah, yeah. You know, I paid all these bills that I had and, and cut down, like I got rid of a storage unit. I got rid of a complete storage unit because I was like, well, shit, I can't do anything. So I hired a guy and I'm like, here move this here, move that there. And we went through all the stuff and organized all this stuff. And I ended up selling a bunch of it and getting rid of it. So I kind of like, uh, just organized my life and was sort of productive during the downtime. I think that's called adulting. Yeah. Was that what it's called? Yeah. <laughs> that's what the kids call that adulting. Kids yeah. I did a lot of adulting <laughs> over <laughs> like because it, yeah. I think the Havery tour ended, ended in October and then, uh, oh, and I was supposed to have a deviated septum fixed. I ended up cheat, cheating, oh, okay. uh, you know, chickening out of that. But because I- <laughs> Those are pretty they, rough from what I've heard. They told me don't you know? watch any videos. And of course, of I went course and watched do. videos and I was like, oh, fuck. But, you know, just going through that, like going and getting the CAT scan. And they said, then some one doctor, I got a second opinion. One doctor told me it would change my voice. Another doctor said it wouldn't. So Jeez. I started like getting worried. Actually, a, a vocal teacher told me it would help my voice. It would actually give me more airflow because I I was having a really hard time sleeping on the last Hapri tour, especially in the bunk on the bus. And the quality of the air was freaking me out. So when I got back, I was uh, getting an ear, nose, and throat. Well, we had this fucking exhaust leak for like the whole tour. Exhaust was coming into the bus? Yeah, and then we were having all these Jeez. different people come out and I'm like, like this is not worth it like fucking carbon monoxide coming in or whatever i'm like we're lucky we didn't all fucking wake up in the hospital or wake up dead you know yeah, like that's some serious shit. did you have any air purification system on board i don't or? know what we i think we we asked the driver to clean the filters and then he, we had some specialists come out and try to fix it but there was a time there where they were all like they had everything dug out of the back lounge so just as a precautionary measure i went to see the ear nose and throat doctor plus now you're seeing like all these guys are coming out with like they got mouth and head cancers and stuff like i saw Ugh. you know uh bruce dickinson and the guy yeah, from poison yeah. mm -hmm. you know and they're both doing well thankfully yes yeah. in in remission i was so happy for both of those guys they caught it quick so i'm like yo check in there for everything <laughs> you know like because you Lesson know learned especially back in the drinking days you don't know what you did with who yeah. and you know you're hearing these different rumors you're hearing michael douglas saying things and so, uh, yeah, yeah. yes, yeah. right. So oh boy. I got that camera put in and he said, yeah, your, your septum is like, he's like this side, your left side is like all like you can, you're not really getting a lot of airflow through there. Mm. So, but, uh, yeah, so I chickened out on that. So if I get another, you know, I don't know, four months off, three months off, maybe I'll do it. Okay. But we'll see. Jeez, that's a rough one, man. But we got that new song chasing demons, uh, with Howard Jones. I mean, uh, I'm assuming that came about because you, uh, with Hatebreed, were on tour with Devil, Devil You know. know recently. Is that how it came about? Actually, I've had a song for years. Doc oh. Doc gave me the song, and when I when I had my uh, hard drive crash, I lost a lot of my own original songs. I lost a lot of lyrics, but then I sent oh, it man. out to this company in San Francisco, this forensic, like they open it in a clean room, they call it, and it's a lab, and they they got a lot of my stuff back. And some of that stuff went on the Hate Breed record last year, but then like the more melodic stuff and the stuff that was just written by other writers, um, for instance, Mark Morton, who, who kind of, I guess he doesn't, he co-wrote the first song. It's called This Is Your Life. Um, we were giving him co-writing credits, but he says, I don't know, man. I don't remember this song, but he definitely sent me the song. Um, so but, so it's basically like inspired and co-written by him. The song's killer. Uh, but so him and Doc, I found those two and I was like, shit, I got to put these on the record. And the the album vocals are different um, from the from the one I released on the jostahq.bandcamp.com. That was the demo vocals, which I saw some people commenting about those vocals. I once I was all healed up, I went and retracked. Okay, gotcha. Um, but you know, it's interesting to see because now with social media, like five years ago, whenever I did some of these songs, some of them are even older. I wasn't that involved. I never cared. Now I actually check my Twitter, I check my Facebook, so it's kind of cool. Like I feel like the fans, in a way, made this record better. Because I had okay. I had this like I had the first album the first Joss album to live up to, 
And then I also had like their feedback in a way, which kind of helped. And I knew Doc is a great songwriter. Like he's wrote, he wrote songs on this new Body Count too. That's a great record too. Yeah, it's oh a fun God, record. It's awesome. really good. I, I just had Ice T on my podcast, and yeah, and so oh, so great. Doc, I was like, dude, is this song still available? And he's like, yup. And so um, I said, I got this bridge for the middle part that Charlie worked on. And uh, we sent it to him and he's like, man, that, that bridge is killer. It's kind of like a crowbar sludgy kind of part. So there's like elements of God forbid in there. There's elements of kill switch. There's elements of kingdom of sorrow. And then me and Howard doing the vocals. It was just fun. Awesome, man. We got a couple more minutes with Jamie Josta. I would love to uh, pick your brain a little bit uh, on some UFC. Cause I know you're an MMA guy. Uh, Cormier versus Johnson. Who do you think is going to win that match? I, I don't know. I fight, want not match. Right? I want Daniel Cormier to win. Yeah. But I feel like there's been issues with that camp with Luke losing, Kane's injured. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, what about the drama with Luke and Verdum? There and then mm. Daniel's also like doing so much commentating. Plus, you had Khabib miss weight. Like, what's yeah, going on yeah. over there? Like, I feel like if this was not his singular focus, if there's any distractions that could possibly affect the outcome, the last person you'd want to have any distractions before a fight with is. Anthony Rumble Johnson. I mean, mm -hmm. the dude just touches people, even with like punches that don't look at all that like a touch of death. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. people go to sleep. I mean, the guy broke Arlovsky's jaw. He's put oh. out everybody at multiple different weight classes. Any, and he's the I think probably one of the few who've already put DC on his ass with a punch. Sure. So, but I'm gonna say DC's gonna play it safe he's gonna and grind him. he's gonna grind him and win by. Yeah, unanimous decision or mm. submission. All right. If he can get out of the first round, I think that's I think that's wise. Joe, you watch about as much UFC as you do WWE. <laughs> no, <do> I, <laughs> I watch more UFC than WWE do because you? WWE is at zero. So oh. anything. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I do have a fleeting relationship with it. I always rooted for guys like GSP. Okay, I think he fought Lesnar. He no. Was it? <sighs> no. There was a big who fight. DC. Lesnar no, and GSP never fought. No, no, no. no. Two different, different weight. weight yeah, two. Uh, who am GSP's I too of? tiny. You're thinking of either Frank Mir. Frank Mir, that was it. Or Randy Couture. Frank Mir won. It was yeah. the Brock Lesnar versus Frank Mir fight. Yeah. That's why I don't like Brock, Brock won one and Frank won one, right? I think so. They fought I twice? I, uh, uh, see, this is where I'm a little stodgy. Let me, let me. But I know that Frank smashed him if there was a second time. The second time. I remember Frank uh, smashing him. But uh, yeah, I think uh, I think I, I think I'm right in line with you, Jamie, on that one. I think, you know, but nobody's ever knocked out Cormier. If there's one guy who can do it, though, it's Anthony Johnson. And uh, but you know, Cormier's gonna play it safe. I think he's gonna embrace the grind, as the wrestlers say. Uh, I say Cormier probably. Unanimous decision. That's, yeah, my, that's sure. my pick. That's what you think too, that's Joe. Unanimous. <laughs> yeah, uh, UFC 100. That was the second one. Mm. Lesnar versus Mir too. Oh, okay. Thanks yeah. for looking that up. Uh, and last one for you. You know, our boy CM Punk. He didn't do well. You know, uh, I would like to see him back. Another fight, maybe. Uh, you know, another guy who's just, you know, premiering in the UFC. You know, the one thing that you can't take away from him is that Mickey Gall has ended up being a killer. He's taken people out. He looks amazing. He really is. He'll probably be a ranked guy soon, I think. So what if you bring another guy who maybe is like, a, eh, let's see if this guy will make it in the UFC, put him against Punk. Punk gets another year or so of, of training. Maybe it'll stand a chance. You know, I'd like to see him back. You know? Yeah, put him against Mike Jackson, who lost to Mickey Oh, Gaw. that's a great... He lost... And he's got, like, a little uh, MMA journalism thing going on, so he has a little bit of a name. Yeah. And uh, even though he's got more experience than Punk, they both share a loss to Mickey Gall, so, I mean, it makes kind of sense. Or go to RFA, or now I think they merged RFA and Legacy, or they merged two of the smaller promotions, and get someone, not their champion at that mm -hmm. weight class, but just sure. someone, you know, who's coming up unranked or or has a, only a couple amateur bouts and only like, you know, one or two pro fights, and yeah, put them against them. 
But or put him in one of these smaller promotions and just do it on Fight Pass. But everybody just tweet mm. Dana White and tell him give um, <laughs> give, give CM Punk another, another fight. Yeah, I you know because he wants it, but they got to make the fight happen. Yeah, I think the Mike Jackson one is smart because Mike Jackson lost quicker to Mickey Gall than CM Punk lost to Mickey Gall. CM Punk lasted about twice as long. Neither of them put in good performances, but. You know, that'd be an interesting one. There's yeah. a little smack talk between them uh, after the fight. So, yeah. Who I think was it's the a guy good that one. used to walk out to Bolt Thrower? Josh Barnett. Yes, that was it. Very good. DC fought him and it was ugly, oh, man. It's, it's usually ugly when DC yeah, fights. Yeah, he threw him in the air. And, oof, oh, those scary. throws. Scary, DC scary stuff. That's great. Shout out to Josh Barnett, though. Thank you so much for coming by. We appreciate it so My much. My pleasure. Man. Thank you, guys. Listen to the Josta Show great great radio show podcast whatever you'd like to call it it's awesome look out for that new josta record catch these guys on tour with anthrax and kill switch engage right now jamie thank you again man. thank you guys appreciate it and we're continuing this loudwire podcast twofer with another hardcore legend john joseph and joe is actually at the anthrax kill switch engage Josta show right now so he's not able to be with me right now for john joseph but that's okay because i get him all to myself uh he just put out a new chapter of his book evolution of a cro-magnon uh an amazing tell-all book that is just a complete roller coaster of emotions his entire life but he came out on the other side with one of the most positive and I think wise uh, attitudes that I've run into in, in quite a bit. Uh, so we're going to be talking to him about that, talking to him about these Ironman competitions that he runs. One of the most insane uh, feats of physicality that anyone could put their body through. And he's done it multiple, multiple times, you know, not just as an act of endurance, but an act of discipline you know, and patience. I mean, I can't tell you how much I admire that, you know, from a guy who's run a couple of tough mutters in his day and, you know, tried his best to get through those, made it to the end doing another one in May. So talking to him about that. Here it is, John Joseph of the cro Mags. <laughs> All right, hey everyone, Loudwire Podcast here, and right now I'm being joined by Mr. John Joseph of the cro Thank you so much for coming. And Blood by, Clot. Man. And Blood Clot. Yeah, new new record, record, man. Coming out this spring, right? Absolutely. Well, coming out uh, July 14th. Okay, there's the official date we got for that. We got the song uh, up in arms already. And you're hearing it that, uh, hearing it first, we're doing uh, the uh, U.S. tour with Negative Approach. Right, yeah, I saw that on your uh, your Facebook. That yeah, you're, yeah, you're yeah. Doing some shows with them, awesome tour, especially if you like the uh, the old hardcore. Yeah. Definitely got to check that out. Uh, so that is one thing I wanted to talk about. This band Blood Clot, really talented group of guys: Nick Oliveri, Joey Castillo from Queens of the Stone Age, uh, Todd Youth from Danzig, and I'm glad that we have a, a release date for that record now because you know we got up in arms not too long ago. Yeah. I'm just like, where's the rest of this record? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's great. About 10 years ago, you released Evolution of a Cro Magnon, a incredibly uh, emotional tell all tale of your life uh, through all the ups and downs. And there's a new afterword that you've just written for this book now. Incredibly powerful, as I was saying to you before the mics turned on. One of the most powerful pieces of writing that I think I've ever read in a musician's memoir i mean i've read a lot of these things and you know some are good some are bad this one you know it hits you on some of the most deep deep levels uh, and in this afterward you're talking about confronting one of your various foster families um this one would be mrs valenti <laughs> uh, probably would you say uh, the worst of the of the foster oh, families absolutely. as a kid yeah I mean, when you confronted her after all these years and after all the different things you've been through, could you even describe it as anything close to something you have felt or experienced previous in your life? 
Well, it was unexpected to begin with because I I was doing uh, a reading in Looney Tunes, which is the next town over. And I just wanted to pass by the house because I never had since I left there. Yeah. And when I was a kid in whatever, 73 or 74. So it was just, I just wanted to go look at the house. Yeah. And, uh, the you know, the girl that was driving me, um, Stephanie was working with the book thing. And uh, she was like, are you sure? That's not going to fuck you up. And I was like... Nah, I need to do it. And then, you know, I pulled up and pulled across the street and it was this old man watering the lawn across the street. And I was like, you know, I just got out and uh, kind of was like, hey, you know, who lives in that house over there? And he was like, you know, Rosa. And I was like, yeah, I just was like, what? And then... uh you know, when I told him I was one of the foster kids that was in there, he like looked in, in my eyes and then like dropped the garden hose and ran it. He and ran like, for yeah, because yeah. he, you know, I think like, you know, maybe whatever they were, they were expecting us to come back or something. So it was really unexpected. So, you know, it was on the fly. I just was like, yo, I got to go knock on that door. And then Stephanie was like, you want me to come with you? And I was like, nah, I just got to do this, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, it's really weird. They had all the shades pulled down and, like, it looked like nobody even lived there. And, uh, you know, when I rang the bell, nobody came to the door. And then I started pounding on the door. I mean, um, you know, I, I, I don't... Uh, then she opened up the door, and uh, I was like, I just noticed the mole under her nose, right. and I was like, that. I made her say that it was her. Mm-hmm. Like I was like, is your name Rose? And she's like, what? Are you? You're like really nasty old lady. Some what things don't the change, hell yeah. are you knocking on my fucking door like that for? Yeah. So then, like. She, like, said it was her, and uh, I just was like, yo, I was one of the foster kids in here, and then the daughter came to the door, and she's like, you know, oh, my God, John, you know, John McGowan, we were just talking about you, come inside, and I was like, yo, are you fucking in illusion, like, Mm. that we had some good times here, like, I was like, what makes you think I want to go into that house, you know? But it was funny because, like, the things you think of, the first thing I did was look to the floors because they used to make us sweep the carpets with toilet bowl brushes to get right. all her hair and the lint out of her carpets. Yeah, she was adamant that the toilet bowl brush yeah, was Yeah, it these. was weird <laughs> shit, man. All the little weird shit that they made us do. So strange. It was fucking strange people. And I, and I looked to see, and then uh, they had parquet floors. I was like... Yeah, I guess because, you know, you don't got no fucking slaves here anymore. Yeah. It's easier to maintain. But, yeah, it was, uh, the anger was was there, but I was able to control it. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, uh, I mean, I went and did one of the best readings I've done, I think, you know, afterwards, just because I was charged with that energy. Yeah. Of confronting them and telling them that of all the fucked up shit they did to us and how they made us feel like pieces of shit that didn't matter. I was like, you know, I just wanted to confront her and tell her that she didn't win. You know, you didn't, you know, crush my spirit, you know? Yeah. And, uh, it was, it was definitely heavy. For sure. And, 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 uh, I just turned and didn't walk back. And then I said, Stephanie had the window open so she could hear. And I was like, I didn't even look back. I was like, what are they doing? And she's like, oh, their fucking jaws are hanging down. Because, I mean, never in a million years did they think that I was going to show up and knock on their door on a Saturday. Absolutely. Like, you know, whoa. When you did and, the reading. And, and, you know, for effect, I like... Had a fucking wife beat her on yeah, and like, 
you know, told him like and your sunglasses. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I was like, she's like, "How are you and your brothers?" I said, "Ah, you know, since we got out of lockup, <laughs> we're all good now." And then she was like, "What is this dude doing here?" You know, like, man, that's such an intense moment that you can read about uh, in the new edition of the book. Uh, when when you went to the book reading that day, did you tell the people who yeah, came about what I happened? I did. I wow. said, you know where I just came from? Unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. It was uh it was a definite uh heavy moment. Where more jaws One I'll never forget. Then, like more jaws dropped at the book reading. Like I just came back from this place that you Yeah, just yeah, read they about. were just like, What? Like and My you're God. able to come do this? I mean, I guess that speaks a little bit to the therapy of how I worked on myself through mm -hmm. the writing and everything else I've been doing over the years to, you know, heal from all of that, you know, and the aftermath that followed, you know. Mm -hmm. There's one line from the book that really stood out to me about your process of writing the book and how it helped you. Uh, you said, the process of writing this book is a form of therapy for me, and if I don't spill my guts, all my guts, my healing won't be complete. Yeah. Now, when you were sitting down and writing this book all those years ago, uh, was there a level of detail that you felt like you needed to hit to spill your guts properly? Uh, yeah, because there were certain things that I wanted to overlook, which was... Uh, yes what those older dudes in the foster home did to us. Yes. You know, the sexual abuse stuff was something I never told nobody. And uh, I kept getting to it, and I would just have these breakdowns, you know, at my computer. And I would just, like, you know, just uncontrollably, uh, uncontrollable emotion and crying. You know, it was just... And then I would... Uh, skip over it and not and be like I can't put this shit in there. It's like you know, I mean it's embarrassing that well, people do that kind of shit to you. But through the process of uh, talking with certain people, I realized that's part of the story. You know, yeah. And to leave it out is uh, it's cheating the audience in a way of uh, and cheating myself of working on myself of the full experience and uh you know being as it was you know something i never told anybody i mean my mother didn't even know nobody knew oh one of my brothers even denied it and then because he's you know it's like oh that didn't happen and then my other brother was like ma that shit happened mm -hmm. and then she was like said to him like you know you need to come clean. And he just was like, I don't want to talk about it. So, you know, to me, I was like, it was part of the experience of writing the book. You had to, um, you know, kind of cleanse your soul of that stuff. And that was my therapy. I didn't go to any kind of therapist or drug program or anything. That book was what did it, you know. Do you feel the residing effects of having written that book as a means of self-therapy? Do you feel the residing effects of that today, even just 10 years later after releasing the thing? Absolutely. I, I, I mean, I did this podcast in uh, Kona for when I was there to do the Iron Man. And mm. It's an emotional thing anyway, because, like, I waited all those years to try to do that. My friend died, like, three days before I left for Hawaii. He relapsed wow. into addiction, and, you know, I helped this guy get sober, and he fell down the stairs in the subway and hit his head and was in a coma oh. and, and died. And then, like, you know, we were just going over the talking about the process of everything and I just lost my shit. Like I, you know, it was, it was, you know, it's still, it's still, uh, you know, raw to this day, you know, mm -hmm. but it's a different way of dealing with it. I'm not going to have destructive behavior about it. You know, 
I went and, uh, you know, did an exceptional hard race and conquered my demons that way. It's the, it, I mean, Kona Ironman is like, it's the hardest one day uh, endurance event on the planet. So that's how I work out my demons. You know, my coach, Orion Mims, is like, we're all running for shit and facing it. And that's why we, we do this thing that we do, you know. So, uh, you know, like I said, it's uh, it's a day-to-day process. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't, myself, uh, I actually, I run uh, like <laughs> Tough Mudders and Spartan races and stuff. Obviously not quite the same degree of difficulty as an Ironman. Uh, for those of you who don't know the specific details of the Ironman, it starts with a 2.4-mile swim followed by a 112-mile bike ride and then a marathon run. Absolutely insane. I think a Tough Mudder, the the longest one is like 10 to 12-mile runs with like 20-plus obstacles, but like still difficult, but I couldn't even imagine doing one of these. Yeah, like, well. And it's, it's like an all-day thing, too. Yeah. I mean, my first one, I played a show the night before with the Cro-Mags. This is hardcore, and I had to drive back and do that shit on no sleep. After playing a show, unbelievable, with a broken bone in my foot, oh, and uh, and ninety six degrees August day, and uh, you know it was thir- it took me thirteen hours, but I wasn't going to be denied. You know, it's a certain uh, certain mindset it takes. And, mm-hmm. and I'm not great at Ironman, but it's a discipline, so it teaches me to be disciplined in all the other areas of my life. Discipline to write this. Everything takes discipline. Sure. You know, so uh, that's that's uh, what separates the talkers from the doers, man. A lot of people talk a lot of shit and say this and that. And I just uh, try to let the action speak, you know. I mean, I remember uh, speaking of competing when you're injured. I mean, learning about yourself. When you're doing that, I remember the last Tough Mudder I did, it was like a almost a 100-degree day, and there was uh, like a 45-degree pyramid thing that people were helping each other up, and it's super slippery, and you're holding people on your shoulders trying to get them up this thing, and my legs buckled at one point, and we all slid down, and I smashed my tailbone on the bottom of this thing with two people crashing on top of me. thought I had broken my tailbone in like mile four. And could barely walk, and still, I was just like, I, I'm here. Like, I've trained for this thing. I've got to finish it. Luckily, I didn't break my tailbone, but for three weeks, still, I couldn't sit after that. Yeah. Like, it's unbelievable. Like, when you find the will within yourself to get through something that insane, it really does teach you a lot about life. Because, to me, when I'm running those things, it, it sort of mimics the... Uh, getting through the pain of just living it's like you have no choice yeah. you just have to keep going and it, it also proves you know we're we're much more uh capable than what we think we are yeah uh you know i always I, my, i've been on the like i said the day the uh, rich roll podcast a bunch of times and one of the most amazing podcasts he had on there was david goggins the they call him like my friend's a seal, and he's like that guy's fucking next level. Wow! And he talked about how even when we reach what we think is our peak, we've actually only used forty percent of our ability. Yeah. So it's a mental, it's a mental thing. And uh, in the back of my last book, Meet Us the Pussies, I put mental toughness training tips, and that's really what it's all about, because. There's a lot of people that come in physically fit, and then when the mental challenges they start, break. they break. Mm-hmm. So that's, uh, you have to be mentally uh, tough, you know. And I think that's, you know, evolution of a Cro-Magnon is, um, there's a lot of examples of some tough mental people in there, and then people that who weren't, you know, that caved under pressure. And that was something I was doing a lot too, you know, back in the day. So, I know one thing that helps me get through those uh, those long runs and just the training and and actually doing those 
big events is that for me, I get to a point where I realize I need to let go of the idea of feeling comfortable. A lot of people sacrifice what may make them better for the sake of comfort. And I know I have a lot of anger towards people that has to do with, you know, choosing comfort over all else. When you're doing these runs, do you find yourself in a space where you're just like, I'm dying in pain, you know, I'm burning up right now, but I need to let go of taking that, you know, personally in a way. Well, you know, like they say in the Marines, you got to embrace the suck, man. Yeah. You know, so I don't, uh, I personally enjoy the pain, believe it or not. It's, yeah. I know that it's purification. So uh, I know it's part of the whole uh, test to push through. You always hit. You know, when you come off the bike and it's 112, you just did 112 miles and swam almost two and a half miles, and then you're like, oh, shit. Like, if you start getting in the transition tent thinking, I got to run a fucking marathon now. Yeah. So I just keep it light, crack jokes, you know, uh, put the grease, what needs grease in, and, and get on my, 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 you know, compression kit and, and get out the tent as quick as possible if you give your mind, I'm writing a book right now all about PMA and yeah. positive mental attitude. And it's, uh, you know, like I, if you give your mind even one crack to, to you know, destroy you, it will. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, you know, you have to have your mantras going in your head nonstop and, uh, you know, it's not just the racing, it's the writing, it's 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 everything, uh, you know. Like, uh, even working on this last album or going through and trying to update this uh, evolution of a Cro-Magnon, I mean, there's always going to be a test of what desire, what you desire. There's, there's uh, you know, that's the job of Maya or illusion is to take you away from the goal that you've, uh, the path. You know, it's the it's the process of weeding out the bugs, like they said when I was in the military. Mm -hmm. You know, you can hide a little bit, but we're going to find you and we're going to weed out the bugs. If you ain't supposed to be here, you're going to get exposed. So it's that constant process of, uh, you know, chanting those mantras in your head and then staying uh, focused. You were in the Navy, right? Yeah, I was in the Navy. Navy. So you went through Hell Week? Nah, I didn't go through Hell Week. Ooh, I got okay. hurt before that, yeah. Jeez, yeah. Yeah. I, but I imagine... I did, like, preconditioning, and, uh... I mean, I went... Came out of lockup, and, uh... I was very physically fit. I boxed and lifted weights and ran and did all that stuff. So when I went into boot camp, they made me like the company uh, command, the company uh, training person, which for all the other guys, yeah, wow, and uh, and then they, you know, the preliminary tests and to get into buds, and then the precondition, and then I hurt my uh, my leg, and it just wasn't meant to be, you know. And I told my friend, I was like, you know, I always think about, you know, what. If, if that didn't happen and I would have been able to finish and do what he's like, that wasn't your path, bro. Mm. Like, you know, to hear these, somebody like that say that I inspired him to do what he's doing and, you know, showed him a lot of stuff. I went to the premiere of his film. Uh, he was in Act of Valor and uh, he's like introducing me like, yo, this is the guy that took me to the yoga centers and all this other shit i'm like dude i like look up to you like you know this dude's like incredible and uh yeah i mean everything happens for a reason my path would have been completely different um had the military thing worked out but it, it didn't i was a mess i was taking drugs and you know all kinds of stuff so it was, uh, you know, I had some bad stuff go down even in the Navy in Norfolk, so. Yeah. 
But lucky I met the Bad Brains, you know, and uh, that was the turning point for me in my life. Especially with uh, when it comes to PMA. And yeah. I like HR, you know. Uh, yeah. Maybe the most important, like, philosophical aspect of punk rock ever, even more than, I would say even more than Straight Edge. I oh, mean, hell yeah. Straight yeah. Edge, those dudes, most of those guys fucking turned to drugs and did all kinds of shit. Yeah. It's like, where are they now type thing, but... You know, if you don't get into something for the right reason, it comes back to desire again. Hmm. And I just wrote this section in my book. I'm like, um, change a section called "Changing Your World," and it's you have that ability, but what is? Why are you trying to do what you're doing? What's is it out of ego or? do you really want to change your life? Mm. Because if it's out of ego, it's not going to last. That's only going to get you a certain, uh, to a certain place in your life. If the desire is not pure, then the other stuff will manifest and take you away. That's why Prabhupada always said, don't be surprised at the ones that go. Be surprised at the ones that stay. Because mm. that's, you know, the real test. And, I mean, although H.R., he took that all from Napoleon Hill. Right, that book. I mean, he put it in his own uh, vernacular, so to speak. Yeah. And put it in the song Attitude and filtered it down through the punk rock. And that's what I've done, too, in my own way, through Absolutely. my writing, through the music. I'm, put, I'm doing a book on PMA. It's like a daily uh, guide how to achieve not just short-term but long-term positive mental attitude. With that, you can't be stopped in anything that you do. And that's the difference between those that quit and those that push through. So they have that in their arsenal. It's to stay positive you know, under any and all circumstances and work through the stuff rather than, you know, falling apart, which the pressure is what defines character. Yes. You know, anybody could say anything. Let's see what happens when we tighten the screws on that person and see what they're doing then, you know? I mean, I think Florida Iron Man is freak storm rolled in it was 38 degrees this freak front everybody got caught out there myself included i met they canceled the swim i made the whole bike 30 mile an hour winds freezing temperatures and i got a short sleeve shirt and shorts compression putting plastic bags that i found on the road inside my thing to try to keep warm and then i made it halfway through the run and i got hypothermic i was throwing up and dizzy and the they medical people were like that's it you're done and i was like i was like you know what i am done but that was my error you know i had a chance at t2 between the bike and run to run to my hotel and get sweatpants and do whatever and i chose not to so the first person I emailed was my boy who's a seal and I he was in he was in uh the Middle East, you know, going wow. th doing shit. Yeah. And he took the time to write me back and told me this whole story about um when he went to Buds and he got uh like ended up in the hospital and almost died and pushed through and you know, told me like, hey, man, you fucked up. You weren't prepared. You didn't check the weather. You didn't. And he's like, you need to get back on the horse and write, you know. So I signed up for Cozumel, which was three weeks away. And I went down there and PR'd, hmm. set a personal record. So right. that was rather than, you know, even doing the blood clot record, I went out to California to do the Super Frog, the Navy SEAL Half Ironman. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I tore my calf probably about two weeks before 
training in the sand. It just tightened, and then I tried to run like 15 miles in Central Park the next day, and it just... So I got out to L.A., and I stayed off it, and I figured, all right, let me test it. I tried to do a three-mile run, and it was shot. And my uh, guy that does the sports medicine stuff for me was like, if you run on that, you know, you risk tearing your uh, Achilles. So I had to bail on the race. Yeah. So trying to turn adversity into something positive. I called up Todd Youth and I was like, yo, we've been talking about doing these songs. I was like, yo, I'm not doing the race. Let's, uh, you know, get these songs. So we went in and demoed it. Five songs. We ended up getting a record deal. And then I asked to have a meeting with uh, guys from ICM, Howie Tannenbaum, for some pilot stuff I wrote. And they met with me and they're like, hey, we want to represent you. So, uh... And, I mean, he signed Vince Gilligan that did Breaking Bad. So, I mean, wow, he's, okay. like, top level. Yeah. You know, and I just tried to turn, you have to try to turn an adverse situation into something positive. And that's what PMA is about, you know. It's daily practice. Like, all right, this is a test. I got to push through. I got to make something, you know. When you come from the background I come from, it's always about making something out of nothing. Yeah. That's what punk rock was too. We didn't, we lit, you know, I was living in a burnt out fucking building, like for real shit. Like what, you know, so trying to turn the situation around, that's what it's about. Uh, even if it takes a, a little bit of time to do that. Uh when uh, does the PMA book come out? It's supposed to come out this year, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm, I got a little bit more to do, and then uh, gonna shop it around. There's a couple, okay, you know, book labels that I'm interested in that does these type of books. So, okay, sort of. Is it like self help type? Uh, someone's someone's using a blender in the kitchen. So. Is that what that is? That's a blender. Holy yes. shit! Crushing what ice. are they fucking blending? <laughs> fucking nuts and bolts. Yeah, marbles in there. Uh, like um, yeah, I guess it would be for lack of a better term, a self help kind of thing. Yeah. But I just see so many people. I've been working on it for two years, and now with everything that's going down, people are losing their shit over Trump or losing their yeah. shit over this or whatever. And it's like, man. Just step back and take a deep breath, man. You know, it could always be worse. Sure. And it was like one of the examples that I say in the book was like, you know, as bad as we think we got it, I watched this guy the other, like, I don't know, it was about a year ago, and he had cerebral palsy, and he had to walk down the street with a walker. Mm-hmm. And he was smiling, and it was like it took him so long just to make it down one block. Shit we take for granted in life. Our health. We take being alive for granted. You got, that's why every day I wake up, I give, as the Rastas say, thanks and praises to the Most High because, you know, even taking a breath the next morning is is a gift, and you got to see it that way. Instead of being like, oh, my life sucks. You know, I have a couple of friends that I know, and I just have to distance myself from that because I just posted something, and I was like, I hate for to say it, but it's like it's it, it's a term referred to as an asshole. <laughs> you ask me my advice, and I tell you, and you do the exact opposite thing time and time again. It's like I'm telling you, how to beat this situation and you keep asking me but you do the opposite of what I'm telling you then after a period of time you know I'm gonna not take the time to try to tell you what what's up you know you gotta and it was like that for me too people offer me the advice but if you know it's it's, it's very bettering yourself is a very scientific process in that you have a formula, you apply it, and you get a result. So that's what bhakti yoga teaches you too. You don't change the formula. 
you know, thinking, oh, I know better. And that's the problem with, I mean, I was like that for years. I know better than what somebody else, you know, some master of yoga or martial arts or whatever is going to teach me. But that's just false ego, you know, mm -hmm. and you have to let that go and realize, like, that's why when you walk into a dojo, you're, you you say, please teach me. I You know, I'm yeah. fool number one. If you don't come with some humility, you're going to learn humility very quick the hard way. Yeah. So, uh, you know, but just certain people just keep constantly... It's called chewing the chewed, man. You, you, you know, it's like taking a piece of sugar cane that's been through the, the mill and it's just dry straw and you you keep trying to chew it and get some pleasure, some taste out of it, some sweetness. And you keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over. You know, and that goes to the three classes of intelligence. The first class intelligence is somebody tells me not to do something, I don't do it. You know, okay, you tell you told me don't do this. I can see you're a very wise person. I'll take your advice. Then the second class is we have to get burned touching the flame and then okay, I won't do it next time. And the third class is we keep constantly touching the flame and getting burnt. Mm -hmm. So I kind of fall in between the second and third one too. Sure, yeah. As most of us uh will uh, probably, if we're honest, admit to. We do things constantly that give us the same results. So hopefully at this point in my life, I've learned, I know I've learned that in certain aspects of my career musically, all right, dealing with these people ain't going to work. So just keep moving forward. Yeah. You know. Uh, so last question for you before you got to get out of here. How's... Uh, when it comes to PMA, uh, I you know, and I'm I'm absolutely gonna pick up that book because that's uh, you know stuff that I struggle with, but do try my hardest. Uh, how's your faith in humanity these days? Because I see on Facebook is that uh, I feel like we're all affected by a lot of stuff that we are kind of pelted by. Uh, on things like social media, because, you know, for all the positive, you know, cute animal videos that you run into on there, there's reason after reason to hate people, like, in general. And, um, you know, the people's impact on the planet, things that have to do with the food industry, you know, just a human's negative impact on the planet. How is your faith in humanity at the moment? I mean, I, I, I kind of think that, 95% of the population, you know, work from the center of good. And when they learn and educate, then same as I did, they'll, they too will change because, uh, I mean, I get letters all the time and people write emails. I shouldn't even say letters. Nobody fucking <laughs> does that. Anymore. But I get emails and all kinds of stuff, you know, that the book, re books, help them a lot and the stuff I talk about and uh, which is something of substance because there's a lot of dumbing down and there's also a lot of, uh, I like to say it's kind of a magician stuff like distracting you away from the real substances sure. of life and a lot of bullshit on social media. So, you know, I think most people operate from a good place in life. Uh, most people, and Prabhupada said that too. He said, most people are innocent. They just don't know better. Mm. Uh, I don't think I was an evil person when I was doing what I was doing. I, you know, I just had to be educated. So I think most people, when the education is there, they have the ability to change uh, for the better. And I mean, it's never been... Uh, a more crucial time to need that uh, right now at this point on the planet. What's going on, you know, with the environment and just people's health and this like war has become the norm. Yeah. War is an ill of society, but they glorify it and make it's all the fucking posers. You know, fucking Trump talking all this fucking macho bullshit. Then when a dude comes on stage, he's like, oh, <laughs> he's 
You know, it's fucking yeah. bullshit. You talk to people that been to war, man, they're going to tell you a different story. They're not glorifying it. It's horrific, you know? That's why, you know, we used the image that we used on, on, on the record up in arms. You know, you got to see what the result of all this stuff is. Go to a slaughterhouse. Go see what you're eating. Go see how your food is produced. Go to the cancer ward where people are dying of lung cancer from smoking cigarettes. You know, everyone wants to not be reminded of of the ramification of the what what they're doing is going to have certain uh, reactions. You know, mm -hmm. they don't want to think about that, and I think you have to. That's a sign of in sign of intelligence is that you start questioning things you know that's where the light came on with me and i think most people that uh you know find out what the real deal is they they start to change themselves you know i just read this whole i just read an article about this irish actress and you know she always kind of argued with her friends about killing animals and, 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 and okay. being vegetarian. Her friends were trying to convince her. And she was on the highway and saw a bunch of animals headed to the slaughterhouse and looked in their eyes and was like, they're just in fear and they don't know what's going to happen to them. But she's like, this is their life is over in the next 12 hours. They're going to be fucking dead. Mm -hmm. And she broke down crying. She went home and told her family we have to make a decision and this decision is that this family's not going to eat animals anymore. And, uh, you know, I think social media could be used for good too. Sure. You know, look at all the positive things that's come out of people getting together, uniting under a certain cause. That's good. You know, rallying to stop bullying or, See, me, I come from a different time where if somebody bullied me, I would put a pipe across their fucking face. Yeah. But not everybody has that. And Definitely they, not today. Yeah, and when people are committing suicide because you're picking yeah. on them, that's why when I see people picking on people, I'm like, yo, stop that shit, or I'm going to flip the script on you in a minute. Mm -hmm. And if I bully you, you're going to be sorry. Leave the fucking kid alone. Or all the other causes that's, you know, going on uh, with the African American communities uh, across across America, and seeing every life is matters, every life is equal, you know. So there's a lot of good that can be done through social media too, and um when it's used for gossiping and negativity man uh, if i see people posting that type of shit i fucking delete them yeah. i'm blocking them i don't want to fucking hear from them there's nothing good coming from that person i just ignore them yeah. and uh you know that's what i've uh been doing and i think you know it's a lot easier for social change through different mediums of Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all that kind of stuff. So that's how I use it. Yeah. John, thanks so much Thank for sitting you, down man. with me today. I really, really appreciate your time, man. Same here. Yeah, you can grab uh, Evolution of a Cro-Magnon in any bookstore, uh, but you can also grab it online. Get that new chapter. It's a great, great piece can of Can I just say one thing? If Please. anybody wants to keep up on what's going on in the charity... I'm racing Kona again this year for the for Alexander Owens. You could go to my Instagram page. The website is there on my home page. It's uh John Joseph Cromag uh on Instagram. And uh kick down some money for the family. They're going through a lot and you know, that's uh keep that PMA. Yes, absolutely. Do that if you can. Uh Blood Clot, look out for that new record. Yes, this summer. July 14th. July 14th, up in arms, everybody. John Joseph, everyone. Thank you, man.
And there he goes, John Joseph. What a great guest. Making my job easy. <laughs> way, way too easy. You just pitch him a question and he will go on and on with uh, an amazing response that you just want to sit back and absorb, you know, from a guy who I'm always looking to better myself and find myself in a better mental space. Listening to him talk and just looking into his eyes while he's explaining, you know, his outlook on life to you, you know, I'm definitely going to pick up that PMA book once it's released. Hope it comes out soon, uh, along with that blood clot record. Thank you, everybody, so much for tuning in to another episode of the Loudwire podcast. Please subscribe to us on iTunes. Leave us a five-star rating, a nice comment if you would be so kind. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Leave a nice comment there, too. Uh, hit us up on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. You can follow me, uh, Twitter, at GrahamWire. You can follow Joe on Instagram at Ice Nerve Shatter. Make sure you do that. Thank you so much, everyone. We've got awesome guests lined up for you in the very near future. So keep your ears open, and we'll see you next time.